you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Robson said, Assemblyman Nick Berry, other elected officials, executive members of the International Center for Democracy, special invitees, ladies and gentlemen. May I say how happy I am to be here tonight to speak to you about Guyana, but about the challenges to democracy. And I want to say right at the outset, Senator Paul, Senator Passat, that it, the observation you made, I made a similar observation some time back, and even tonight I was saying that after this event, I saw they have a dance on the program, but you have 90% of the room with men. So how are they going to have a successful dance with 90% of the room being men? And may I, may I also say to you that this is not indicative of what we do in Guyana. In fact, in 2001, when we had far-reaching amendments to our constitution, we ensured that at least one-third of the candidates that party placed on their list to contest elections, they had to be women, at least one-third. And if you look at our National Assembly, the Parliament, it has about a third of the women in the Parliament. And I know when I was president, almost 30% of the cabinet members were, were women too. So I, I agree with you totally, and we are far outstripping even the US elected bodies in that regard. Far outstripping about the role of women in politics because we believe it's very important. Now, I've, I've read the mission statement of this organization, and for those of you who have seen it, it's very profound, far-reaching. And many people may be tempted to say that it's too ambitious, because I've seen not just a focus on democracy, but also the mission statement speaking about development and poverty and the achievement of the sustainable development goals that have been announced by the United Nations. And as I said before, there may be a temptation to think, well, they're trying to achieve too many things. But I, I differ. In, in my opinion, because I think that democracy is an essential precondition, a prerequisite for the achieve, achievement of sustainable development, for the fight against poverty, and for the liberation of the human spirit. And if we had to go back to our own experience in Guyana, because those of you who may not be familiar with Guyana, some of you are not from Guyana, you would see how our history, and a turbulent history it was, how that history affected the well-being of our people. And so, Assemblyman Perry, who is here, who is from another, country in the Caribbean, but may know Guyanese, uh, a lot of Guyanese here, would, would recognize that, that in Guyana, we had an origin and a very difficult origin to much of what you see today. And so I had a, a conversation with Senator Saunders. And we spoke a bit about the 50s and the 60s, and about 
how we are still suffering from the legacy of that turbulent period when external forces, and we were talking about the role of the CIA and the British, how they came into our country, largely because of the geopolitics at that time. They were worried that Guyana would become a second Cuba after Fidel Castro took power in 1959. And therefore, they could not give independence to Guyana under Chedi Jagan or the People's Progressive Party because at that time, they believed that we will take Guyana this, um, along the socialist path and they will have a domino effect across Latin America. Never mind that Chedi Jagan's socialism was about land reform and building schools and getting better health care to people and ensuring that people of every race in Guyana, they had a decent life. But they saw it in the geopolitical context. So what happened? Our people were divided along ethnic lines and we have suffered from them to now from that legacy. And then immediately thereafter, a government was installed, not a government that won fairly, but a government was installed and protected externally, although for 30 years there were no free and fair elections in our country and there was a lack of democracy, but the world remained silent because it was the Cold War period and that government pretended as though it was defending um, Guyana from going along a socialist path. And should the PPP take office, then that will happen. So many of you here, and what am I, I'm going through this, many of you here, your parents, are here largely because of that history. Because when our country was not free, when the army will come and take the ballot boxes at one point, which is well documented. When I, you see parents cry out, cry in frustration on election day because the, the, that little piece of paper on which they put the X was snatched away from them, meaning that they did not have a say, had no dignity, no freedom in their own country. Then when, when that happened, many of them felt that they could not live in that country and raise their children because, they, because of their political affiliations, they would always be subjected to the periphery and that their voices will not be counted. And so when there was no democracy, the economy declined and our people fled. And today, this is one of the reasons why we have such a large diaspora around the world, but in the United States of America. So it was, first of all, the lack of freedom, the lack of democracy that led unaccountable government, that led to a deterioration in rights and a deterioration in economic well-being. And it led to many people seeking their fortunes elsewhere. And so this is why many of you in this room must have a particular affinity to this concept of free and fair elections because you've experienced the converse of it. You've experienced it in blood, people being jailed, and you've experienced it in sacrifices and loss of income and loss of welfare and loss of dignity. And so when I walk around this room and I see people here, I know why they feel so passionate about this issue. And the, the other reason why they feel extremely passionate about this matter is because the history is still fresh in many of their minds, particularly the older ones. That history is still fresh in their minds. President Carter, writing in his book recently, Beyond the White House, 
had this to say about Guyana in 1992. He said, the most personal danger I have felt since leaving the White House was in Guyana in 1992. This is a president of the United States of America saying the most personal danger to his life he felt in Guyana. And it is indicative of the conditions that existed at that time. Because after you would have 30 years of lack of democracy, and it was only with the intervention of President Bush Sr. and President Carter that we managed to eke out the concessions that we were struggling for for ages from the government, the conditions that would lead to free and fair elections. And President Carter read, outlined what they are for. Three conditions they wanted. One was an independent, uh, a balanced elections commission, not pro-government or pro-opposition. Two, an accurate voters list. And three, counting of the ballots at the place of poll. Because you know, when the army collected the ballots in the past at the place of poll and took them to central stations, then they would just change all the votes. And areas that were 100%, almost villages that voted 100% for the People's Progressive Party, like my, my village, when we looked at the, the national results, 3% would be for the PPP and 97% for the PNC in those days. They would change all the results. So those were the three conditions that we fought for. And today, some of them are under challenge again, and I'll come back to that for a moment. But if those people, because you have a rewriting of our history now, an active rewriting of the history, to deny the role that the PPP played to lead Guyana to independence, to fight for universal adult suffrage, because in 1953, and the PPP was formed in 1950, in 1953, only if you were, you were, you had property, or you were literate, you could have voted. And we fought and got universal adult suffrage, led by Charlie Jagger, led by Charlie Jagger, and there is an active rewrite. We write of that issue. So, if you need any testimony to what I'm saying about our, how rigged the elections were, just go to Lord Avesbury report. Lord Avesbury came, he died last year. He came from the British government to, to look at the elections in Guyana in the 1980s and you will see his report about how atrocious the rigging was. The Caribbean Conference of Churches, look at their report when they had a fact-finding mission to Guyana. They will tell you about the hopelessness that existed at that time and the, the lack of democracy. Or the America's Watch, or you go to New York Times and read their report, or even Go back to the period in the past and look at the United States State Department reports and you will see that this is well documented. The threat to democracy, the rigging of elections and the, the lack, lack of democracy in Guyana. So people here feel this closely because there is a history to it. It's not like we're speaking about something alien or not innate in our experience. We have experienced this for generations in Guyana, in the post-independence period. And so now when we see similar trends emerging, they are very fearful given that history. Absolutely fearful. And this is what is happening in Guyana today. So I just wanted to say that the very beginning, to give you a context about why pe people feel so passionate. And I know that the International Center for Democracy has set as its terms of reference 
working around the world. But I know many of the people who participated, I've seen them here, who participated in setting up this organization, they're Ghanaians, and I, I must, I, I feel that they must be driven somehow because of that fear that they see. And I do hope that a significant part of your work will be focused on Guyana. And the, what are we striving for? What are we asking of this center? Not to be partisan to support the People's Progressive Party, but to, to fight for universally accepted values. The United States of America has had a tradition of democracy. Tradition of democracy. That is what the center hopefully will focus on. Not pro-PPP or uh, anti-PPP, but to have a focus on democracy. And, and I want to, before I forget it, attack, um, congratulate the people who worked so hard to put together this organization. It's really a special effort. And I want to say thank you on behalf of all the people. So tonight, so tonight, since most of you are Guyanese and most, and the conversations I've had outside of this room with many of you, there are huge concerns about where our country is going. And people are more particularly worried about the economy, some of them, especially uh, about the economy. And I must confess that I'll be very partisan when I speak about the economy. But there are two issues that I want to speak of before I, I, do, uh, I speak about the economy and where our country is going generally. There are around two principles. One I mentioned before, that is the, the threats to democracy, and particularly elections. And secondly, the threats to the doctrine of the separation of powers. That is, that separate branches of government must act independently. And these are two of the biggest looming threats in Guyana. And if we fail in addressing these, these threats, then our country will slide back so swiftly into the same pattern of the past. So we have seen, let me deal with the first issue. I mentioned what President Carter said in his book, the three conditions that he fought for. And one was a balanced elections commission that is not partisan. So in the Constitution in 1990, what was known as the Carter Center formula was enshrined in the Constitution. Well, in, in that period, because prior to that, the Elections Commission uh, report, there was a commissioner and they reported to the Minister of Home Affairs, who was from the executive and partisan. So in that formula that was enshrined in the Constitution that all the parties agreed to, it said that three members of the, the Elections Commission will come from the government, three from the opposition, and the chairperson will be chosen from a list of six persons that the opposition leader will send to the president. So it meant a collaborative effort to choose the seven person so that you will have a balanced representation here. Now, almost five or six elections were held under that form. PNC accepted it, the People's Progressive Party accepted the formula, and Mr. Hoyt, who was a senior counsel, submitted five lists, five lists in accordance with that formula. Five lists, where names were sent to the president, and we, the, at that time, the president selected one of the six names 
that was on the list the opposition leader said. Now I must remind you that Mr. Hoyt was a senior counsel and that this was a common understanding between the two parties that was accepted, a single interpretation of our constitution. Mr. Granger at that time, his name was on two of those lists, two of those lists. So it would be to our surprise when recently, when the chairman of GCOM resigned, and we were supposed, we, we submitted a list of six names, President Granger at a media branch said, the, this is my interpretation of the Constitution, and my interpretation is all that matters. Now, now, we know the courts interpret the Constitution, not the president. He's a subject of it, but he said, this is my interpretation, that you can only submit names who are either judges, former judges, or those eligible to be judges. The fit and proper category is not no longer in play, although it's provided for by the Constitution. We pointed out that almost every single commissioner, Rudy Collins, Hopkinson, Joe Singh, uh, Rudy Collins was a public servant, and he was a chairman at one time. Hopkinson was a miner, and he was a chairman. Joe Singh was once the head of the army, and he became chairman. Serge Bali is a vet. He, he was chairman. Only do not say what was eligible to be a judge fit the first category, pointed out that practice and a common understanding of the Constitution led us to believe this. But he said, no, this is my interpretation. It took us two months to try to get him to shift this position. I requested a meeting. He did not want to meet. He said, let the Attorney General meet with one of your people. So now we have relented. He relented. And they said, OK, you can submit other names, but we will give preference to the first category. So you can send from the fit and proper category. So he then subsequently sent me a list of criteria that are extra constitutional, and now is insisting that every member that I submit must meet this set of criteria. I said, if we apply the criteria to you, you would not be eligible the two times when you your name was submitted because the two times Hoyt submitted his name, he was already in the PNC for 30 years. I've submitted 12 professionals to the president, everyone more qualified than he is. Many are judges, etc., and he is almost unilaterally being very dismissive of them. Contrary to practice, contrary to the, to the common interpretation that PNC and BBB had over 25 years for approaching this matter. And so it is our feeling, and many others, that he wants to unilaterally appoint someone. He has said something that he doesn't want to, but that's our feeling. Now, if he does that, Remember the Carter Center formula? Then he will change the balance. He will change the balance at the Ghana Elections Commission because it will no longer be 3-3 three, three and the, the, the seven person appointed through common understanding, but he will unilaterally appoint that person so they'll have four, three. And we know what has happened in the past. So that, that is a very, very dangerous situation that we are in. And you will see it gripping the entire society. And it's been a big concern here. And if, a, if a, someone can almost unilaterally move away from the Constitution like that, or accord his own interpretation, without regard for the society and criticism or anything else, we shudder to think about how we will approach this matter. So that's the first, first issue. The second issue is about the separation of power. 
we have seen a consistent effort by the administration to undermine the different branches of government. And this is not new, because we saw that when they had the doctrine of paramountcy of the party. In the, in the 70s and 80s, Apnu believed that the party mattered more than the state. So we had our, court, our courts in Guyana, the, Nash, the party flag flew above our national flag on the courts in Guyana. Now, we've seen how the president has approached this matter. We amended the constitution in 2001 to say that the Judicial Service Commission, the president shall act in accordance with the Judicial Service Commission. That is recommendations from the JSC. Prior to that, it was me. The president had a discretion. What happened? The president got some names on the JSC, four names, and for one year, he has refused to appoint those judges in flagrant violation of the Constitution. He is now moved because I think he feels that he has a different JSC, a different Judicial Service Commission. But at one stage, for three, four months, we didn't have a court of appeal in Guyana. Just imagine that. No, the, for the first time in our history, we didn't have a court of appeal. And so we see a serious move. The Attorney General goes around saying, we put them there, they got a rule for us, you know, in Guyanese Parliament. He threatened a judge to kill him in the open court, and the president did not see anything wrong with that. This is the Minister of Justice, the head of our bar, the Attorney General, threatened a judge to kill him in the court. The last person who did that to me, they found him dead, when the judge ruled against him. And, and we see it on a daily, daily basis. Luckily, luckily for us, we took Guyana into the Caribbean Court of Justice. So at least, and that was one of the things we did under the PPP, so at least we have an external review to decisions made in Guyana. Because I shudder to think with the pressure that we are putting on the judiciary today, what will happen in the future. And, and then the parliament itself. If you look at the parliament, you will see what happens. They, we had we had established several committees under the People's Progressive Party, sectoral committees. Ministers are not supposed to sit on these committees because they are being reviewed, they're sector by these committees. They have violated that, ministers sit there. The Public Accounts Committee has never had a minister on it since independence. They put a minister now on the Public Accounts Committee. They you control the agenda of parliament. We have a com complex bills like the terrorism bill, and nearly 200 pages, and they'll bring it for two hours of debate and pass it. We, we urge that it will go to a select committee. They, they've refused to do that. Refused to send it to select committee. And they, they, let me give you an example of uh, the Coroner's Act. We, um, the government said that there is urgency in passing a new Coroner's Act because there are many cases that need to, they needed to start some investigations. So they pushed it through parliament in a single setting. In the act, they had a feature that if a person of Asiatic origin, Indo-Guyanese or a Chinese person, were to, kill, uh, to be killed, before you start the inquiry, we, you have to contact the immigration agent general. So now that is a feature of the colonial era. We don't have an immigration agent general anymore. That a hundred years ago we had that. So we said, let us take this bill to select committee for one day. And we will change that because it's not reflective of Guyana today. It's a feature of the colonial era. They decided to pass it with that in place. So if anybody gets killed in Guyana today, you've got to go and hunt 
an immigration agent general. That was from the period of indentureship to, to inform them before you start the inquiry. It's just rushing through things through parliament, the parliament doesn't need. And so we see major attempts of the executive to control not just the agenda of the legislature, but to truncate debate and to change much of what we had done, the spirit of the constitutional reforms that we had put in place. And so it is these two issues that bother us tremendously. Because as you know, we had the most far-reaching constitutional change, I would say, anywhere in the Western Hemisphere in 2001. In those, in, in that period, recognizing the complexity of our society, we, passed, we put enshrined in the new constitution five commissions. These commissions, to sit on one of them, you have to have two-thirds support from the National Assembly. It meant bipartisan support. What are these commissions? We call them the Rights Commission. No country in this hemisphere has those commissions. One, for gender, because we recognize the vulnerable groups who are women, one for indigenous people, children, human rights, and ethnic relations. Given the complex nature of our society, we felt that we had to have these commissions in place and approach them in a bipartisan manner. They are now, they are almost truncating all these commissions. The Ethnic Relations Commission is not functioning, so they're replacing a constitutional commission now by an executive action, setting up a ministry to do social cohesion. But the budget, the huge budget for social cohesion in that ministry is used in a partisan manner, more divisive among our people than bringing them together. So those, were, those are being eroded, the constitutional things. I mentioned the four sectoral committees. We didn't have those in our constitution. In 2001, we put them in place because we believe that the government must be accountable and ministers must go to these bodies to account for their stewardship and their sectors. So what we, what we did, we had the majority at that time, we could have taken chairmanship of every one of those four. The one is on natural resources, the other on economic services, one on social services, and the other one on foreign affairs, covering the gamut of government. And what we decided to share it. They will share it too, we'll share it too, and we rotate the chairmanship. I mentioned how that's being eroded. The management of parliament before that, the constitutional change, the executive used to control parliamentary agenda totally. We then did where both sides had equal numbers and the speaker chair it. We reduced the powers of the service commissions, the judicial, police, teaching service, and the, the public service commissions in an attempt to, to have a more inclusive society given the nature. I can go on and tell you about all the changes to the constitution that we made in 2001 because we recognized that our society had needed these complex ways of, of moving forward. And so today, all of those features that we put in place to safeguard people and their rights have been eroded. And that is why there is a big worry about it. Because if that happens, if you control the courts, like recently, a private individual sued the government because the government awarded a contract for six million US dollars above the second rank tender. It is a contract for the award of the meters for GPL, the power company, the, the meters. And so this company sued the government. The judge estab the, the judge gave them a month to, to call a the case for a month. And then, to our surprise, the attorney general approached the judge, and then the matter was heard within days, and there was a ruling in favor of the state. They argued, well, the state can't wait. So if you have a decision, now if I'm a private individual or we in the opposition, if we try to get an early date for any issue, 
you, you can't get it. But the state now can influence the judiciary to give an early date. So there's no fairness anymore. We've been waiting for two years so far to have our elections petition heard. Although in, in our law, it says it must be heard continuously and urgently. Because it's an elections petition. And we can't get an early date for that because they file a lot of interlocutory matters. So even if you're an investor, even if you're an investor in the, and you run afoul of the government for contract law or anything else, not forget the rights issue for a time, and the state has control of the judiciary, this is, then you will never get justice. And so that's why, as I said before, it's so vital that we, we preserve the separation of powers and we zealously guard these institutions that we've worked hard over the years to make independent from a period of the paramountcy of the party when they fall under the, the party in the government that we preserve those days and hopefully the International Center for Democracy would look at those, those two sets of issues. The, on the economy, and uh, maybe I just say a few words about this, our philosophy differ significantly, significantly. We, every single major investment that came in Guyana, including ExxonMobil, came under the People's Progressive Party. Oil was found by ExxonMobil under the People's Progressive Party. The economy has flatlined. There are two sectors, two companies that are producing large quantities of gold now that have kept the growth rate positive, and both came under the PGP. Not a single major investment from abroad. And if you talk to any businessman in Guyana, if you do it an informal survey, any businessman, you. It, they're not investing. They're not going to invest because they feel insecure about their capital. Capricious rates, capricious statements from the tax authorities, politically, the tax authorities have been politicized. Agencies that were set up to defend, like, say, against money laundering are being used now, say, SOFU, which was set up by the PPP under the authority of the commission to support the Anti-Money Laundering Act and the, the Financial Intelligence Unit. Now they report no longer to the Commissioner of Police, but directly to the Office of the President. And their list no longer, they don't go after drug dealers anymore or money launderers. We have not had a single case of that in years. They've gone after political opponents. And the people, particularly business, the business community, shaking shake them up. And so in that whole atmosphere, you're not going to have a change in the situation. Already the economy is in doldrums, and the only way to fix of oil and a nuanced understanding of how oil proceeds can be integrated into an economy without damaging it fundamentally, as has happened in so many parts of the world. Venezuela, 3 million barrels of oil exported but they, but food shortages. Look at many other countries, Nigeria, and many other parts of the world. Poverty, if Trinidad and Tobago now, you go to Trinidad and Tobago, and you go to Laventille, and although we don't have oil, we don't have the sort of extreme poverty that you see witness in those areas. And oil can only exacerbate that. And the Dutch disease, the, the change in relative prices will kill all the other sectors if they're not already killed by this capricious, almost uninformed government action to some of the major sectors of the economy. So we have been arguing, we are saying, have a nuanced understanding of oil. First of all, oil may, may bring large amount of wealth in the future, or it may bring very little. Look at 2040, the oil price per barrel, $130 nearly. By the time mid-2050, it fell to $28 a barrel. It's gone up now to about $50 a barrel. 
such a precipitous drop, if oil is falls into the $20 a barrel, then ExxonMobil may not even be able to pump the oil. So oil proceeds are very volatile. The markets move on all sorts of things, not necessarily just supply and demand. There are a whole range of things that can move the market. And we're saying if you, if you kill the labor intensive sectors, rice, sugar, mining, and, and forestry, construction, so retail trade, where large numbers of people are being employed and try to replace it by only a capital intensive industry like oil and gas. As ExxonMobil said, they will spend probably $5 billion over the next few years, but you will have 300 jobs. You will have 300 jobs. So where are you going to keep it, get it, the employment for these people? And that is why we have to make sure that the rest of the economy is healthy and integrate oil proceeds in a manner that does not destroy the rest of the economy. And, you know, the Norwegian model that we spoke about is separate. But this government already promised people free gas, a check in everybody. You don't have to work in, in the future, you know. And what about the years when you don't get oil money? What about the years when you don't get oil money? So. This, their whole philosophy on economic matters, which I, I would not deal with too much here, um, the whole philosophy is one that we don't subscribe to. Um, spending wantonly on things that don't add create greater welfare for people or lend to the productive capacity. Wanton spending, wasteful spending. Then taxing heavily to support those the spending and borrowing phenomenally. The IMF has said the their, their, um, debt to GDP ratio will go from 50%, and we brought it down from 913% in 1992 to 50% by time we left. We'll go up back to 19% um, to 60% of GDP by 2019. This is the sort of approach. So spend wantonly, tax people, and borrow. Borrow enormously. And that is precisely the path that Burnham followed that led to our country being, uh, when we left office, according to Carl Greenwich himself, that we were spending 153% of revenue to pay debts. 153% of revenues to pay debt. That's what the PPD took over. And we should never forget that. By the time we left office, we were spending 4% of revenue, down from 153% to pay debts. We restored a bankrupt country to economic viability. That's what we did. That was And so, our philosophy is different. But let me come back. I see, the, again, the, the mission statement of the International Center for Democracy speaks about green issues. I can tell you about the approach to green issue, how we were earning money by the sale of forest carbon. It was an economic strategy. For this government, the green strategy is about planting trees. It's not about planting tree, trees. It's a replacement of an old polluting model that ensures prosperity for a country by one that maintains the path to prosperity, but does it in a manner that is more environmentally friendly. That is what we're trying to get over. They've killed the hydropower, saying it was corrupt. And a lot of the things that they were talking about, the corruption, now they have had two years in government, 50 audits. We keep saying to them, lock up the people who you find corrupt. But they said that. Then Norway just came out with a study and said, the only way forward to achieve our target is to build the same a mile of all that they killed. By this year, 2017, that hydropower would have been producing power that would have led to 50% cut nearly in the price of power. Not a single cent of debt on the treasury because it was a 750 million US private investment that would have added two percentage points to GDP. That was, that was what Amila would have done. Would have made a big difference to our manufacturing sectors, etc. So a lot of these things are, economic issues. They, they, 
The reason I don't want to focus on that, that too much is we will fight that battle in Guyana. We'll fight it because every country has economic issues and differences of views. And people are assessing our views and theirs in Guyana. So, but for an international center, they have to focus more on the universal values. And universal values that are recognized around the world are the two that I mentioned before. Free democracy, democracy, and secondly, the doctrine of the separation of power, vital for the future. And so, I, I hope that we will see an enormous amount of work being done in this area, and all of you can help. If we stay silent on this matter, then we, we will deserve the type of country our country will become. And many of you still have a great interest in that country. You all can make a difference. Every single one of you in this room can make a difference. Please get involved. You know, some may be able to help these guys financially, but others with just their time and effort and meeting people and talking to them and lobbying. You know, we have a lot of elected leaders who share here in the United States of America who share concerns, not take, we're not asking them to take sides, as I said before, but who share concerns about erosion of democracy. Please use your influence to lobby them so that they pay attention to what's happening, so that we don't go back to that horrible, turbulent past that caused so many of our people grief, you know, all sorts of grief. And so I want to urge you to support the center. I want to thank the members again for inviting me here and to congratulate them on their appointment. Thank you very much.